All right, I think we're all ready to begin. Thanks Good for morning. being patient during that delay. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to day two. Uh, before we get started, we have a very important matter to, to discuss. It is uh, one of the uh, perils of having our conference in late June for those of us who has birthdays is that sometimes we have to work uh, the conference during our birthday. And today <laughs> is Melissa's birthday. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. So before we launch in today's housekeeping uh, details, I'd like to say a few words about the nonprofit organization that hosts Open Source Bridge, the Stumptown Syndicate. The mission of the syndicate is to create resilient, radically inclusive tech and maker communities that empower positive change. To date, our activities have focused on producing local events such as Bar Camp, Wear Camp, Ignite, and in supporting local technology user groups. We also maintain citizencodeofconduct.org, which provides a templatized version of our own code of conduct for use by other communities. This year, we plan to expand our efforts by establishing a community makerspace. We want the environment you experience here to exist all year round. We're completely volunteer and membership driven. Please contribute, consider contributing in some way. For more information, visit the stumptownsyndicate.org. I'm thrilled to announce this morning's keynote speaker, Alex Bailey. You may know her simply as Scud. Scud is a social justice activist, social justice activist, software developer, and advocate for open technology and culture beyond the open source world. Her career in tech span her career in tech spans two plus decades and two continents, having worked in Australia, Canada, and the U.S. Scud is a delightful and veteran speaker, having keynoted conferences such as OzCon and Guadec, and presented at many more. In 2011, Scud took a hiatus from the tech industry to study sound and engineering. And in 2012, she returned to establish Grow Stuff, an open source project building a website for food cultivators to record their gardening activity. Welcome, Scud. sound? Can you all hear me? Good. I thought they were joking when they asked for organ music requests, but I'm really glad I picked that. <laughs> so I wanted to thank everyone for bringing me here and to the sponsors and to Open Source Bridge. This is one of my favorite conferences in the world, and I've been to quite a lot of them. So uh, I'm really delighted to be able to make it over here this year. I missed last year. I've, I've missed a couple, but I really thank you all for um, making it possible for me to be here and for being the awesome people you are. Open Source Bridge is a conference unlike any other technology conference I've ever been to, so big thanks. Uh, I thought I should introduce myself because I do know many of you, but some of you are like, who is this person? So uh, I've been in open source longer than I care to think, but about 20, no, 10, uh, lots of years, 20 years now. Um, and mostly in the Perl community, where I know many of you from. And I worked in Perl up until about 2007, and then I started working for an open data company. So I've been doing open data for a while, and other uh, open stuff beyond open source. So I sort of went out of open source for a bit, and then I quit the tech industry, and that didn't really stick for very long. And then I sort of came back in, and uh, now I'm working for myself, which is very nice. And I'm back doing open source, but also open stuff, again, beyond uh, just the pure open source software area. This talk's actually part of a process that started last year, and in a way, this is the sequel. So I'll just sort of give you the previously in talks I have given. Um, I was at Guadec in Spain in uh, about this time last year, where I spoke about open communities everything from sort of Wikipedia and Creative Commons that are quite close to what we do here to sort of more obscure things that we can conceive of as open communities. So at the time, I suggested um, Occupy Wall Street, and I also suggested community gardens. And I defined open communities as communities that are open to everyone to come in and participate freely, 
and where they build something and give it away for free. So by that definition, to me, you know, something like an, a community garden, and I know there are many of these in Portland. I actually walked past one on the street this morning to the bus, and I was like, yes, it's a sign. Um, but community gardens are open communities. So I said this in my talk, and then over lunch, I sat down with a guy called Federico, who's one of the founders of the Linux GNOME desktop stuff, and we were talking about gardening, and he's a permaculturist, and, and we were just talking about this stuff, and he said, do you know any open data um, like collections where I can find information about crops and when to plant them for anywhere in the world. And I said, oh, no, that's hard. And I gave him this whole lecture about why that's hard and you can't do that, um, which mostly has to do with governments. Um, but I said, if I were going to do that, I would crowdsource it. I would make a website where everyone just keeps track of their own gardens. And then, um, then you aggregate them and and you can get the full data on who's growing what where around the world. And for Federico said, oh yeah, that sounds good. And off we went, and I slept on it, and I came back and I said, so you know that thing I talked about yesterday? I think I'm gonna do it. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing for the last year. Um, so this is a sort of ongoing story of Grow Stuff as it, as it became, and what I've learned from it. And the main thing I've learned that I wanna sort of talk about today is that Growing food and writing code are remarkably similar. So when I um, started to work on Grow Stuff, I, I got into a government program in Australia where they put me through a small business management course because I kind of set this up as a business. And um, we had to learn you know, accounting and how to do our taxes and things. But they also had marketing classes. And once I got over my initial, oh my god, reaction, because we know how techies are meant to feel about marketing, right? It turned out to be very useful, but they made me go out and survey and interview lots of gardeners. And you know that was really informative and very useful, but one of the gardeners I talked to said something that just really made me think. Her name's Ivy, she's someone I've known online for a decade. And um, she's, she and her wife and her four-year-old son live in uh, the suburbs of Los Angeles, and the four-year-old son is a bit of a fussy eater, and when I say that, I don't mean that he won't eat interesting food, I mean that he will only eat interesting food. He is, they call him the baby Alice Waters, <laughs> and he will only eat local heirloom organic <laughs> produce. <laughs> and he can tell by taste. If you offer him a substandard tomato, he will just be like, uh-uh. Um, so these people have a veggie garden, and they're not expert gardeners, but they have a good climate, and they mostly just put seeds in it. They, you know, huge garden and amazing tomatoes grow. But one year, Ivy had trouble with her, uh, with her vegetables, so she got online, and this is what I was asking her in the research. I said, you know, do you use online resources for your gardening? She said, well, I went to this one forum one time, and I said, you know, I'm having trouble with my zucchini or whatever it was. And all the people were like, oh well, have you done a comprehensive soil test? Because if you haven't done that, it's just not worth the bother. And what sort of greenhouse do you have? And what is your like, um, soil improvement regimen? And she's like, what's a soil improvement regimen? <laughs> and, and she sort of just left and she never came back. And I thought, oh, that sounds familiar. You know, I've seen that on Hacker News. Um, <laughs> so we have this thing where online communities love to be really cool and elite and they're the best. I don't know if it's human nature or, or what that's all about, but the upshot of it is that it's really exclusionary and really elitist, and that it exists not only in coding, which I thought was particularly prone to this, but it even exists among people who grow vegetables. <laughs> it's sad that people are intimidated away from gardening, because growing food isn't hard. Right? I mean, basically, food would grow even if we did nothing. If we all disappeared, food would grow, and there would be fruit and vegetables and things that we could have eaten if we were here because all it takes is a seed and some soil and some air and water and sun, and it happens. And of course, if we help them along, then it can be more productive and so on, and you know, that's what gardening is, but it's really not hard. Like, it's a thing that they teach tiny little children, and children can do it. And growing food is actually, you know, one of the, one of the fundamental foundation stones of our civilization, going back however many thousand years. It was prehistoric agriculture that let us come together in large cities and in large groups and build the culture and build on that technology to grow more technology and to get to where we are today. So, you know, it's a very important thing, and yet people don't do it because they think it's hard. Why do we make it hard? 
we, we really like to, this is, by the way, this is the um, topiary gardens at the Palace of Versailles. So, uh, you know, we, we like to sculpt our plants into our natural shapes and use expensive equipment and try and grow exotic things outside of their natural climates just to show that we can. And we fundamentally, you know, the best gardeners are seen as the people who are the furthest distanced from the basic business of survival and growing food. There's, there's sort of a, a classism at work there where only poor people grow their own food and you don't want to look like you have to do that. There are even parts of the US I've heard where um, it's illegal to have a vegetable garden visible from the street and where they'll come along and dig it up if you, if you grow veggies in your front garden because they feel like it makes the neighborhood look bad. Which leads me back to coding. Basically, code is not hard, just like growing veggies is not hard. This was my first program, more or less. I was about nine years old. I was in a computer shop, and one of my friends showed me how to do it on the computer in the shop and make it, you know, print all over the screen. And <laughs> so uh, that was how I learned to code. And, you know, kids do this, given access to computers and basic literacy, which admittedly are not universal, um, kids can program. I've actually done a bit of, is Yoz here? Yoz Graham? Um, he and I have talked a lot over the years about the idea of folk programming, which is learning programming without proper training, but just through a folk tradition. Someone shows you, you show the next person, you change it up a little as you go. You might call it cargo culting, but a lot of programming happens this way from how a lot of kids learn their first 10 print your name, 20 go to 10, through to all the people who program through Excel spreadsheets to the people who learn HTML by view source in a browser. They're all programming, they're all learning from each other. There's no formal uh, structure or hierarchy around how they do that. And like food, you could say that code is fundamental to our modern civilization as well, that uh, without it, we would collapse just as we would without food. But not just that, the, uh, the code we have actually uh, accelerates and enhances the lives we have and it's like such a central part of the lives we live today. As not, I mean, I'm not saying it's equal to food, but it's definitely fundamental at this point. And yet, I don't know if anyone read this last year, Jeff Atwood, who does Coding Horror, he wrote a blog post in response to this tweet by the mayor of New York City saying, please don't learn to code. He said we should specialize and we should concentrate the coders in uh, businesses that specialize in that and people like this mayor shouldn't learn to code because it was a waste of his time. Funnily enough, like a week after that, um, the judge in the Oracle versus Google case uh, learned to code and managed to like toss out Oracle's arguments on the basis of, uh, they'd said that it would take an experienced coder a month to write some code and the judge is like, come on, I did that in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't know what Jeff Atwood has to say to that, and I, I wonder if he's you know, changed his mind about this at all, but it does show how important it is to know code no matter what area you're in. But we're at the point where, where most people don't know how technology is made, just like most people don't know how food is made. And you know, by analogy with big agriculture or big farmer, you know, big tech likes to keep it that way. They want to um, preserve their interests. And so we get a lot of consolidation. We get these big tech companies, you know, just <laughs> eating up smaller tech companies until you just have a few big ones. And we have these platforms instead of open APIs. And we're starting to get a lock-in where you have a choice of which of these, uh, you know, big platforms that you use. But they're all kind of bad for you, <laughs> right? They're bad for your privacy. They're bad for your attention span. Uh, most importantly, or I think most importantly, they're bad for your self-determination, for your ability to do what you want to do with your data and have your own sovereignty over that. So this is um, a town in the UK, in the south of the UK, Devon, um, called Totnes, and it's a transition town. And the transition movement is something that started in this town around about 2005-ish. Uh, it's basically like a left-wing survivalist group. I don't think they'd like me describing it as that. But instead of getting their shotguns and running for the hills, uh, what they did is they stayed where they were and decided to build resilience in their community. 
against what they saw as the impending infrastructure breakdown that would be caused by peak oil and climate change. So when they talk about infrastructure breakdown, they're thinking about things like transport and energy and food systems and the economy. And so transition towns exist all over the world now and they're doing things like building local alternative power hubs and uh, car sharing and community gardens and things like that. In the tech world, we can think about infrastructure breakdown, not just, you know, like a backhoe going through a cable, but also things like, you know, Google Reader closing down is an infrastructure breakdown that we're experiencing. Or even things like business model breakdown, where you're using a product that, or a service that has no business model and so it shuts down, or one that has a business model that's not really working out for them. And so they start basically slapping more and more ads all over the, <laughs> the service until it degrades to the point of unusability. And I think we've all seen this, right? So what would transition or resilience mean for the tech community? Whereas we already support a lot of those values in open source, and I know most of the people here would agree with that today, that we, are, we value independence and redundancy and having options and choices. And we value skill sharing and building community and connections between ourselves, between each of us. So we've established that growing food is vital to society and is a basic skill that we can all learn, right? And so is tech. But for some reason, we're artificially making this difficult for people to get involved in. Recently, working on Grow Stuff, and especially working on Grow Stuff sort of from my kitchen table at home, outside of the tech industry, and without having to sort of get involved in a lot of the startup culture sort of stuff that goes on, I've been able to take the time to think a bit about what's going on there and how to avoid that in Grow Stuff. And, um, a lot of that has to do with minimizing elitism and minimizing ego around code. Not making it all about what's the fastest or the sexiest or the latest or the shiniest or who's got the biggest pumpkin, but <laughs> about <laughs> helping and supporting each other at whatever level or whatever stage we're at. This is a quote I came across recently that I really like and keep thinking about. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. I also noticed there that it doesn't say, and then you have to do this and this and this. There's no requirement to level up. You can actually just keep doing what you can. So how do we help people do that? Well, I think reducing formal gatekeeping is a really big part of that, and just learning by doing, making it about you know, hands-on and sharing what you know, and pair programming is something we do a lot of. Also in Grow Stuff, one of the things we do is think about how we deal with frustration and with things that are hard. In the tech industry, I often found that I would be trying to do something that was really hard and I would pound my head against it and get frustrated and, you know, it would just really eat at me trying to get something done. And we just said, you know, that's not fun. That's not, you know, enjoyable, an enjoyable way to work. So we, we talk about passing. You just say, pass. I'm not going to do this, it's too hard for me right now, and that just might be because I haven't had enough caffeine, or it's late at night, or you know, I'm having a bad week, or it might be I just don't know what I need to know to do this, but it's okay, I can pass, and either someone else will pick it up, or maybe I'll pick it up again next week when I've you know, got a bit more caffeine into me and it'll all make sense. Or what usually happens is we realise we didn't need it after all because we've made it more complicated than we needed, and we can say, well, you know, did we really need that? Can we make it simpler? Can we just do something more basic that we can do now? Start where we are, use what we have, do what we can. And then later, when we have, you know, the tools or the skills we need, we can go on to uh, do maybe what we were trying to do in the first place. And, you know, I don't want to sort of talk too much about all the individual things that we do on our project, because I know all of you on your projects have your own ways of doing this stuff and your own ways of supporting your developer communities. And I think, you know, it's important that you do that in a way that sort of speaks to your people and your culture. So, you know, keep on doing that. That's great. But, you know, we, we need to all be doing those things. But beyond our own projects, our individual projects, I think we could be doing other things like supporting 
indie tech companies, the equivalent of the farmers markets of the tech world. As they say, you know, know the producers, connect with the people who you know, build your software, build networks with them, know where your technology comes from. It's not as efficient, but it's better for us. And you know, you can have too much efficiency. You know, economies of scale aren't always good. Uh, I've been reading some blog posts by Anil Dash, who is a blogger that I really respect and has been writing some really good stuff lately about income inequality and class in technology. One of the things he pointed out is that venture capital funded tech companies concentrate wealth. They make a 1% very, very, very rich at the expense of 99% of users and even of many of the people who are building the tech. He also has a really good post which I recommend you hunt down about blue collar coders, about people who don't have a you know, post-grad degree from Stanford or MIT. They might have vocational training or they might have no training or just on-the-job training. They've got their sort of local skills that they're using you know, in small businesses, just wherever they are. And as techies, we sort of denigrate this, even at the same time that the tech industry is complaining about skills shortage and that they can't find enough people to work in tech. I mean, we've all mocked unskilled coders and the sort of WTFs and the bad website developers and the MCSEs. We've all had a joke at their expense, right? But in doing that, as I'm coming to realize, we're perpetuating an elitist hierarchy which magnifies and mirrors existing social inequalities. And I think I'd rather not be doing that. So instead, what I would like to see is people from all backgrounds and levels of skill, whether they have the PhD from Stanford or you know, the one line of you know, basic that they know how to write, uh, coming together and forming a, a complex and resilient ecosystem in technology. We're probably not going to get rid of you know, big tech any more than we'll get rid of big ag or Walmart, much as some of us may like to. Uh, I think you know, it, it's going to be a, a mixed environment of all different stuff, but let's make sure we have options and have a diverse ecosystem. So coders, if you have the opportunity, please help someone out there seize the means of production and make programming more accessible. I know there's a lot of groups that are already doing that, and um, some of you may be involved in RailsBridge, Guild Develop It, um, various summer outreach programs that run around the world, and push back against rock star culture, the idea that we have to be elite and cool and, and you know, that person and help people fight their imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome has a couple of elements to it, but one of them is that there's an expectation set that you need to be a rock star. Remind people that no one's actually, oh, well, some people are expecting it, but that we're not expecting that. And help flatten out those inequalities that we see in the tech world. And who here gardens? Who has a veggie garden? Okay, whoa, Portland, that's awesome. <laughs> For those of you who do not have veggie gardens, please see those people. If you want to learn how easy it is to grow stuff, talk to them. This is me. Uh, get in touch with me anytime. And this evening in the Hacker Lounge, we're also having a bit of a grow stuff hack session slash information slash tour of what we're doing. So please come join us then. And I have Tim Tams. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I will do Q&A. We have about five minutes left. I, I hurried through it because I knew we started late, but then all my, you know, timing was off. Val. Oh, great talk. Thank uh, you. Do you have... I think it's called Open Source Bridge. <laughs> um, I mean, there are pockets of it everywhere. Hmm? Oh, the question was, is there a place where people try and fight techno-elitism, or is it just individuals here and there? And I said, I think it's open source bridge. Some other events, I know that Ada Camp, which Valerie and some others here are involved in, is one of those places. And uh, if anyone has any suggestions for other events along those lines, I'd like to hear about them. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that suggestion was for 27C3, uh, which is a conference along that has um, lots of talks online on these subjects. Yes? Mm -hmm. The answer there was that Bar Camp 
which is a response to Foo Camp, uh, which was O'Reilly's conference, which was invite only. Bar Camp is open to everyone. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.